Good morning. Welcome to worship at First UMC San Augustine. I'm your pastor, Pastor Tim Turner. Welcome to this Epiphany Sunday. You know, we're finishing up our Epiphany series. So today is our, our last Sunday to, to light the Christ candle, the last Sunday to see the Christmas decorations up. And as we begin, let's just start by singing, I saw the light, shall we? together shall we father you are good the one who gives us light in the darkness the one that shows us the way that leads to life the way the truth and the life God we give you the praise this morning and we ask that you draw near to us even as we draw near to you in these moments in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, it may seem like we're leaning too far back into Christmas as I read the story of the Magi. But the story of the Magi coming is actually quite fitting for Epiphany. It's the traditional epith Epiphany story as they followed the light that led to the light of Christ, as they were kings from a foreign place who came to crown the true king. It's the story of Epiphany, the reason we celebrate this small season that maybe not many of us know about. Uh, and it's the last time that we'll light the, the, the Christmas candles. It's the last time we'll have the Christmas decorations up before we switch seasons and begin walking in the life that God has given so one more time, let's read this story from Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, 
he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word so that I may pay him, go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped of the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had, had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You know, one thing that's long amazed me about those magi is how much, they, how greatly they sacrificed in their present moments for a future that must have felt quite uncertain. I mean, the journey to Jerusalem for these men, it would have taken them nearly two or three years all the way from their homeland in the Far East. And on top of that, they had no certain word that they would even find what they were looking for when they first set out. All they had was the, the word of, of foreign prophets, ancient foreign prophets in a book that's not from their own land. You know, I, I, I often also wonder how their wives must have felt about their stargazing habits. I mean, these are men, intelligent men, wealthy men. Surely they had the, the best version of ancient telescopes, but to pretty much everyone else, I mean, their stargazing habits was much like a hobbyist, just looking in the night sky for, for something out there. You know, I, I can picture one of, the, one of the wise men, one of the magi saying to his wife, Honey, this is the one. This is the star that will finally guide the way. Of course, she rolls her eyes a little bit. You said that last time. And the time before. And the time before. What makes this star any different? What makes this star any different? It's a question that each of those men had to answer before they finally left the Far East for that two-year journey west. Because by the time they made it home, if they made it home, they would have already spent four to six years of their life on that massive quest to find the Messiah. You know, I'm amazed at how greatly they sacrificed in the present for a future that surely felt uncertain. In Matthew, the story of their, their journey, it begins well after they've left the Far East. In fact, they've been traveling for that two or three years, and they're just arriving in Jerusalem as Matthew's recounting of it all begins. So this is the beginning of chapter 2 once more. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who's been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. Now, if we are an innocent bystander in the market of Jerusalem on that day that the Magi come into town, this has got to be a wild, once-in-a-lifetime event to see these men walking the streets. I mean, these men, they dress in strange garbs. These men, they, they talk with strange 
accent. These men, they smell of strange spices from strange foods. But most of all, in the streets of Jerusalem, these magi come asking a strange question. Where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? And the crazy thing about these magi is that when they ask that question, they fully expect everyone in Jerusalem to know the answer. But no one seems to have a clue. In fact, the talk of a child born as king from the, the mouths of these strange men from a strange foreign place, it seems to almost strike revolutionary fear in the hearts of the people of Jerusalem. And you can imagine the questions they must have asked. Is Persia knocking on the door trying to invade? Will Rome and Herod finally be upstaged by a foreign power? Is war imminent? Why are these strange men talking about a new king? Now Matthew, in fact, paints a vivid scene of fear, anxiety, filling the streets, as well as anxiety from Herod, as he anxiously searches for answers. Listen again to verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. You know, at this point, Herod still has not met our Magi face to face. You know, it may look from the surface that Herod's already talked to them, but he hasn't yet. It's just the mere thought of these magi arriving in the town. All he has, he's heard that these men have come to the city of David. And it's their mere arrival that prompts this great search of the scriptures. Call in all the scribes. Bring in all the priests. The pagan King Herod has suddenly become spiritual. And really, Herod gets a ton of light from his search. The priests and scribes, they, they give immediate witness to, to Bethlehem as the place where the child king was to be born. But does Herod pick up and go to Bethlehem? Does Herod or any of the scribes and priests, for that matter, do any of them go pay homage to the king of kings and lord of lords? No, because the truth is this, even with all that light, even with all the clarity that God has already given Herod, the scribes, the priests, Herod still can't seem to tell night from day. L listen to verse 7. Then Herod secretly, he secretly called for the wise men, Learn from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And there's a reason that Herod calls the Magi to the palace under the secret cover of a dark cloth. He says he longs to worship to go pay homage. But instead of going himself, he sends the Magi from the far east to make a short trip down to Bethlehem. If, if Herod truly wanted to find the Messiah, he could have gone himself. But instead, he sends these strange men 
from a foreign place to go get the light for him. And the craziest thing of all is Herod has all the light that he needs to make a faith decision for God. I mean, God has already made the coming Messiah plain as a Christmas star in the night sky, prophesied down to the exact location, location even from ancient prophets. You know, it really doesn't take long for the searching scribes and priests to find the place where God has written it in ink. But Herod, he's apparently too busy with his important work to go find the Magi, born king of the Jews, for himself. He's too wrapped up in his pursuits of self-gain, too wrapped up in his own image to see the light in life born into this dark world. Meanwhile, the Magi from a foreign land sacrifice all their dignity, all their reputation, chasing after a God whose people don't even recognize his arrival. Let me say that one more time. The Magi are chasing after a God whose people do not even recognize his arrival. Yet the word of the Lord still sends these faithful magi to Bethlehem. And they keep following the light that they've been given, the light of that star. Listen to verse 9. When they heard that the, the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. These strange men from the Far East, they seem to know more about the Son of God than the very people who live next door. That's what really catches me on this. Matthew says that the star stopped over the house where Jesus was there in Bethlehem. Now, if we thought it was foolish that the people of Jerusalem missed the star, what about the people of Bethlehem? Am I right? I mean, the people of Bethlehem had the star right in their vision. Better yet, what about Mary and Joseph's next door neighbors? It's not like God was keeping any of it quiet. I mean, there is a star, for crying out loud, that appears in the night sky. And then the star starts moving before it stops above the house where Jesus is. And no one in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria even notices? But hang on, because I'm not actually done. <laughs> the priests and the scribes of Jerusalem, they literally read the prophecy with their own two eyes. And they do nothing with it. How much more light can the light of the world give? But these magi from the far east, the ones who are said to be far from God, they hear the word Bethlehem, and they give their entire lives to an uncertain future of whatever dim light God was going to give. And when they find the poor child Jesus tripping on his first steps, when they see God's light has led them to a promise fulfilled, they are overwhelmed with joy. And rightly so, because they have found what we so often miss. Friends, we so often find ourselves searching and craving for any joy, any peace, 
any hope. Especially in this present world that's full of so much worry, so much uncertainty. But it's not like the light of Christ is, is out of our reach. In fact, there are so many times in, in my life that I can look back on. Times when, in my life when I felt dark. It felt difficult to step through the motions of life. And yet when I look back, I can see that God was with me all along. I can see that the light of Christ has never left me. That God was always faithfully by my side. And it's in those moments, those everyday moments, when it doesn't actually feel like God is near, that God gives us the same outstretched hand offered to us both near and far, to both Magi from the Far East and Israel natives close to the newborn Messiah. God asked that compelling question. Where will we go to search for light when the darkness seems to cover every part? Friends, the beautiful gospel of Christmas is that the true light of our world is never far from lighting our way. To actually find the promised Messiah, the Savior, the Healer, the Redeemer. And there's a choice we have to make whether or not to follow the light that God's given. Now, I'm sure when those Magi finally made it home, I'm sure not a single one of them regretted the long journey. I'm sure when they finally made it home, they, they could look in the eyes of their wives and say with certainty, we have found the one our heart longs for. Because that's the kind of fullness of life that God offers to those who truly seek, those who truly follow the light of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give God thanks. Amen. Friends, let's sing one more song. A good, another good epiphany song. How great is our God.
Friends, as we go from here, may we follow the life that God's given us. May we pursue those New Year's resolutions. Give our all to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.